Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of Lifespan by David Sinclair, why we age and why we don't have to. Little by little, millennia by millennia, we've been adding to the average human life. Uh, Originally, most of us didn't really get to 40. Now, most people do. Then most people didn't get to 60. Now, a lot of people do. And largely, these increases have come from things like gaining access to stable food sources and clean water. And really, this average, we've been pushing up from the bottom. We've had less deaths during infancy and childhood. So, the average lifespan has been rising over the centuries and millennia. So, although the average has been moving up because of these advances in our uh, living conditions, the range, so to speak, or the limit hasn't really moved Mm -hmm. at all. So, throughout all of human history, if you were super lucky to just live on and not let the other things take you out, for 95% of us, if you do get through that, you're not going to make it to 100. Simple as that. That's our limit. It's a pretty high limit because uh, we've been home to 100 billion people on earth and out of Everyone who's been here and of all of human history, the Guinness World Record holder of the longest living person, 120. Yeah, only one. One person out of 100 billion has lived to 120. So, whilst the average has been creeping up, it seems like there is definitely a maximum limit that we, there's a, like a ceiling that we hit and that's kind of it. And the, the point of this book though is trying to say, well, how can we, how can we go beyond that limit? Yeah, and a lot of people might be thinking, oh, do I want to be living at 100? I'll probably have Alzheimer's and be crippling and everything like that. But we can have the cake and eat it too because what Big Dave is going to say is we can extend life and also prolong our vitality. And by extending life, we're just simply keeping you alive as long as possible. And prolonged vitality means not just more years in your life, but more active, healthy, and happy ones that are in your future. Yeah, and even better than that is he's saying it's coming sooner than most people expect. So, by the time people who are born today are reaching middle age, these changes should be here. So, he's saying that in the uh, within the next century, he's saying the person, someone who hits 122 becomes the second person out of uh, 100 billion people ever. Then they're actually thinking that they've uh, lived quite a full life, but maybe not yet a long life because there's a whole bunch of people who are about to live a hell of a lot longer. That's pretty exciting, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, hopefully, yeah. It'd be cool, especially the, the, the vitality yeah, part. It'd be cool to want. be 120 and feeling like and 38. Yeah, that's right. But it's pretty exciting because there isn't an upper, upward limit, he says. There's no biological law that says we must age. So, prolonged healthy lifespans, they're in sight and a real possibility for us. So, aging and all the diseases that come with it, are the results of multiple hallmarks of aging. Now, there's a few technical terms here that are going to pop up, but this is really essentially what happens as we age. We see it as Alzheimer's or different diseases and illnesses, but your body and your genome sees it as slightly uh, more technical issues that are popping up. So one of them to start off with is genomic instability, which is caused by DNA damage. Another is the attrition of the protective chromosomal end caps, um, which are the telomeres. Bring us home with a few more, Ashto. <laughs> there's, a, there's a long list here. There's a, a bit of a mouthful, there, lo- a few of these. Loss of healthy protein maintenance, deregulated nutrient sensing caused by metabolic changes, mitochondrial dysfunction, accumulation of sensant zombie-like cells, <laughs> that, and they, they inflame the healthy cells, exhaustion of stem cells, altered intercellular communication, uh, and the production of inflammatory molecules. There's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on here. Yeah, they're all technical hallmarks of aging. They're technical things and all researchers agree if we can somehow address all of these hallmarks, we can slow down aging and if we can slow down aging, we can force all disease and if we can force all disease, then we can push back death and we can be 130, 150 years old. Yeah, it says that addressing these hallmarks of aging, they're kind of like the beginnings of a rather strong tactical manual for living longer and healthier lives. So, what we, if we can kind of knock all these things out, we're going to be pushing ourselves way beyond our current maximum limits. So, the science is moving faster than ever before on some of these things and this is the accumulation of many centuries of knowledge that have come together. We've got the revolutions that's going on in robotics right now, which can analyze tens of thousands of drugs every single day. We've got sequencing machines that read millions of genes a day. We've got wild computing power that processes trillions of bytes of data of speeds and all sorts of theories and aging that are getting chipped away at all around the world. So, it's an exciting time when it comes to aging. 
So all these things that we could barely pronounce uh, seem like pretty massive challenges. Thankfully, big old Davo, he's found the one kind of meta thing, the one thing that we can fix that will fix all those problems, and that's the epigenome. And so epigenetics, it's been a field of study since 1942. He says that if the genome is like the computer, the epigenome is like the software. So the, the software, the, the coding, once that starts to go a little haywire, then all these other problems, these hallmarks of aging start to pop up. So if you can go to the source, if you can fix that coding in the software, then you can kind of prevent all those other things from happening. One of the best metaphors to visualize this process of what happens with our genome and epigenome is the use of a grand piano. So with this, each gene is a key and you hit a key and it produces a note. And from instrument to instrument, depending on the maker, the materials and circumstances, the manufacturing, each grand piano, it's going to sound a little bit different, like all us humans, a little bit different. But even if it's played the exact same way with the exact same genes uh, in our body, they're also going to be a little bit different and can have all sorts of iterations. Yeah, with those keys on the piano, you can play them pianissimo or forte. You can play them, you know, soft or loud. You can play them sustenuto or staccato. Uh, you can mix and match them in all different sorts of ways. You can play a bit of jazz, a bit of ragtime, a bit of rock, a bit of reggae, a bit of a waltz, whatever it is. Uh, but we've we've kind of all got these all these same starting blocks, the same keys, and we're just combining them in different ways. So the pianist is using all of the genes and the keys and everything like that to make this wonderful music. So if the pianist is, is all sound, then there's no reason why we're going to have good music ongoing. But let's just say we're a few minutes into the piece and the pianist just misses one key. And the first time that happens, you probably won't notice it. It's still it's playing music like Ashton. You're a wonderful <laughs> piano player, Ashton. You can... You can do it. If, if, you, if you miss one key, someone like me, you wouldn't really yeah. notice it. I think if you just, you know, you're making a, a an octave and your your thumb accidentally bumps the 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 key next to it, you probably wouldn't really notice. You just keep going, you move on, keep playing, keep playing, keep playing, making this nice music, which is our, our normal healthy lives. Then uh, maybe another couple of minutes later, then you fudge another one, and again, you probably don't really notice it. But then those errors, those mistakes, they seem to come more often and, and more frequently. You start to fudge a fudge note, you play the minor instead of the major, you start to just be putting all these random keys and chords together and sort of the longer you go, the longer you play, the more mistakes that you're making. And that's kind of the, the metaphor for life. We're nice, we're healthy, everything's going well. Every now and then we're going to get a bit crook, we're going to miss a key. But as we get older, as we get further into this piece, we're going to be making more mistakes. There's actually nothing wrong with the piano here. So the genes and the actual coding and the DNA of the human body, that's not the issue. It's the pianist, the epigenome that starts missing notes and missing the whole things. And the music goes from beautiful Bach uh, or Beethoven to, um, you know, my, Adam Jones. <laughs> yeah, Adam Jones in year seven class with uh, um, Mr. Sano. Mr. Sano. In, and that's, that's why we age. That's why our hair goes gray, our skin goes wrinkly. The, they're all kind of the same things. It's just those little mistakes that start to add up over time and it starts to become some of those classic hallmarks of aging. So as we end up with the uh, pianist who's, let's just say, 35 beers down, absolutely <laughs> smashed, can't play at all, uh, the notes that she might be hitting is all over the shop here and uh, in our metaphor, our human body, it's where we pop up with all sorts of illnesses that happen with this wild pianist. And uh, the way the doctors treat this as we get older, it's, it's pretty simple. Yeah, when you, you go into the doctor and you say you've, you've got a dodgy knee or you've got a chest infection or you develop a tumor, what modern medicine does is they treat that one specific illness. They'll do an operation or they'll give you a course of pills or whatever it is and they say, okay, here's the problem. Here, we'll whack a Band-Aid on top. Here's the solution. You go away until the next time you get crook and come back with something different and then they treat that individual instance as well. It's a bit like the old whack-a-mole medicine. One illness pops up, you smash it, then another one pops up. Because as you get older um, and you think about the moles that pop up, um, as you get older, the rate of the moles that pop up out of this machine that you got to keep whacking down, the rate just starts going through the roof because the pianist is starting to get uh, more and more deteriorated. So let's say that we're fighting cardiovascular disease, which is, I think, the most common cause of death. If we are to solve that problem, if someone's really old, on average, we only add one and a half years to their lifespan mm. because something else is going to pop up. Similar thing for cancer. If we solve cancer in the human body of someone who's really old, you're only going to extend their life by 
only two years. And what we've seen is that there's an exponential increase. After the age of 20, all illnesses, uh, the likelihood of getting these illnesses go through an exponential increase. Uh, cancer, heart attack, diabetes, uh, stroke, dementia, heart failure, all these things are just going to get more and more likely. There's going to be eventually a point where there's so many moles popping up, the doctor can't possibly uh, treat them, and that's obviously when you cark it. Yeah, that's when, it, when it's game over. But I think it's really exciting because out of all those diseases which we're shit scared of, and uh, there's actually the meta disease which is curable, which is aging. And if we can cure aging, the rates of these moles popping up uh, is going to go all the way down and there's no reason why we need to have these illnesses that pop up. So, and as we're saying, the meta thing to treat for aging is this epigenome. So, if we can focus on that uh, and treat that, then there's a good chance we'll be able to extend our lifespans. So, in theory, the only thing we need to do to extend our life and uh, also our vitality and our healthiness and our happiness is to treat that epigenome and to keep that healthy as long as possible. And thankfully, Big Old Davo, he's found a few simple things that everybody can do right now so that, that are going to improve our longevity and, and help that genome, you know, help that penis crack their fingers, give a massage every now and then mm. just to keep them playing the right notes at the right time. So, give a... Crack that penis and give it a massage every now and then. <laughs> that's, that's what you got to do. Jesus, Astro. <laughs> that's that's uh, Astro's advice here, not Dave. Dave's advice. One of uh, Dave's first pieces of advice is to go and fast. This is a big one. After 25 years of researching aging and reading thousands of papers, this is actually the one banger that all scientists agree on and it's got the best chance of making us live longer with simple technologies today and that is simply... Going out there and fasting. Yeah, if you want to, if you want to live longer, you got to eat less, and you got to eat less often as well. And they've done a whole bunch of studies. Again, our our lab rat comes into into the picture here. They found that uh, they had a group of different rats. Some they gave them the you know normal three meals a day, kept them happy, kept them satisfied, and then the other group they actually gave them twenty percent less food. Um, and they gave them 20% of their food was indigestible cardboard, which they just shit out the other end. It wouldn't have tasted too good either, I don't reckon. But actually, those rats that had 20% less real food, they actually lived 20% longer. Mm, that's a pretty... Um, out of all the rat studies, that's a pretty good rat study to that's be a part of. I think <laughs> the rats got thrown in that. So, I don't, think the, uh, I don't think it translates directly. I don't think you should add 20% of your meal being indigestible cardboard. Uh, probably just eat... 20% less is probably a good way to do it instead. That's it. Uh, there have been similar studies, not all the cardboard study, but similar things that have been proven in yeast, fruit flies, rodents, and perhaps our closest cousin, which are monkeys. And with them, it was very compelling results again. So before the studies, the maximum lifespan of monkeys was 40 years. But 30% of the monkeys who went through some sort of caloric restriction, they were able to live well beyond that and 120 years old in human age. Yeah, so basically what they're saying is rather than us, we, we humans, we've had one out of 100 billion. I don't know how many zeros are after that decimal place that in percentage terms that have made it. They're saying here that 30% of the monkeys they studied, they were able to get to that maximum. So that's like 30% of humans living to 120, which is pretty crazy. Now, there are a few different uh, prescriptions or a few different ways that you can do it. Obviously, the meta thing is to eat less and to eat less often, but there's a few things that he suggests here that we can do. One popular method is to skip breakfast and have a late lunch. This is the intermittent fasting, like the 16-8 diet where you, you eat for eight hours a day. You've got this one eight-hour window, maybe from 12 till 8 or from 1 till 9, and then all other hours of the day, you don't eat. Another is like the, the famous 5-2 diet where five days of the week you eat normally and then two non-consecutive days you have a lot less. So say for example, you have 75% less calories on two days a week. One option is to try skipping um, a few days a week. So maybe one out of the seven days you don't eat at all. Or one way is to actually have a whole week off. Every three months, take a whole week off eating. Mm. It's pretty extreme. Probably don't start at that. Maybe build up to it. You've done that a few times. I've done five, five days. Yeah, it is, it is pretty extreme. So, we don't want to starve here and too much is going to put your body through too much pain. But the whole idea is just have that feeling of hunger as much as possible. And it's a bit like going to the gym. Like when you put your body through some sort of stress, you end up improving your muscles. In this sense, um, we end up extending our telomeres. That's a technical term I learned mm. in this book. Don't ask. Don't quiz me anymore. I was once pitched a um, 
a pyramid scheme that the the one, they had this magic drink that extended the telomeres. Yeah, so you can live it. longer. Sounds I don't know good. if the drink did anything. You just don't follow up with a follow up question. What's a telomere, <laughs> yeah. mate? Don't ask that. And then it, uh, yeah, it's good. I've just had to notice there's, a few, there's basically one sort of um, one I guess meta thing here is that it's kind of like a little bit of stress is good for the body. That if you're too comfortable, a bit of an anti fragility perhaps. If you're too comfortable all the time, then your body's not going to uh, cope well. You're going to die earlier. If you can put a bit of stress, so if you don't eat a day a week or if you don't eat for a couple of days in a row every three months, that little bit of stress is actually a good thing for your longevity. That uh, is a good segue into our next one, which is all about exercise. So it's been a prescription really for vitality over the centuries. All civilizations have known all about it. Again, when researchers studied the telomeres in the blood cells of thousands of adults with different exercise habits, there was always a striking correlation. Those who exercised more and went put the body through the same sort of stress, again, they had much longer telomeres. So there's no way around it. Um, we need to be pushing ourselves in our exercise as much as we can as we get older. Yeah, he says that only 10% of people over age 65 are actually doing regular exercise and getting their heart rate up. And he says there's a vital uh, difference between a brisk walk and a slow jog in that you really need to get that heart rate and that respiration rate up. You know, going out and going for a walk around the block is, is good, but you really want to be getting pretty puffed out. So he says that the, the thing that takes the cake is high intensity interval training where you're going through periods where you're really getting really puffed. You know, you're working pretty hard, having a bit of a break, working pretty hard, having a bit of a break and really getting that heart and lungs pumping. A third one, another one that's again, putting your body through some sort of stress is going through some really cold temperatures and you're exposing your body to this. And it's, again, it's going to get those telomeres Lengthened, cranking, 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 out those tel- <laughs> cranking those telomeres, <laughs> and uh, of course, activating your longevity genes, which is all, what it's all about. So, one study looked at 2,300 middle aged men from Finland uh, for more than 20 years. Apparently, in Finland, anyone listening from there, you've got a bit of a culture where you jump in the ocean and go through these extreme changes in your temperature. And they found that the Finnish who went hardcore. Uh, cold ocean swimming up to seven days a week. They had a two-fold drop in heart disease and fatal heart attacks and all-cause mortality events decrease um, for these people. So not bad. not bad. So they say there's a few things to get outside that. One is obviously you can go on the high end. You can go a bit hot. Uh, if you go for a, a sauna, uh, it's kind of good, but uh, he says that even better is to go on the other end, which is the cold. So maybe it's the cold, the cold shower, the ice bath, jumping in the ocean, getting in the snow. He says even if you're out in winter, go for a walk in a t-shirt instead of three layers um, just to keep yourself warm because he says that the one thing that is clear is that spending your entire life in a thermo-neutral zone is a bad thing. So if you constantly got the heater on in winter, you've got the air con on in summer and you're around the same temperature every single day, then that's not good. He says the best thing is a little bit of stress. Either get really hot uh, every now and then, like jumping in a sauna, or even better is to get really cold by jumping in the ice. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. You're three for three here, I think, at this stage. Uh, exercise might be, it might be a stretch two to claim that. Yeah, two out of three. I'm two out of three. I'm not going <laughs> to compromise on my fasting. There's no way I'm oh, going really? to days without food. Really? Oh, man. It's a, it's Are you a, surprised about that? What's well, the best thing? No, I'm not surprised. I don't reckon you could handle it, mate. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> oh, I was trying to reverse psychology. Nah. Yeah. So then you'd be like, yeah, no, I can do it. Nah, didn't, didn't get it. You, need a, you need a reverse, reverse psychology. Reverse, reverse. And then I'll reverse. Anyway. Um, okay, we're both two for three here and I think we're not going to get any points from here on in. <laughs> I think these ones have been pretty, the first two especially have been pretty easy. You know, eat less, exercise more. They're pretty solid. Cold maybe is a bit different. Now we're going to get into uh, a little bit more new age stuff, a little bit more experimental stuff. So there's all sorts of pills and supplements and things like that out there in nature that we can inject in our body. Not you don't have to get it. You, know, <laughs> you can eat it if you want. But uh, enzymes super important. So we need enough amino acids as as we can. You can get them through meat. You can get them through plants, or you can get them through um, different, say, protein shakes and whatnot. But the amino acids are absolutely amino acids are absolutely critical. How, another pyramid scheme we got pitched was enzyme pills as well. They must be all tapping into this we research. Both, we both got <laughs> yeah, the enzyme pills. He and, got, I, and he got you. <laughs> yeah, big time. <laughs> well, so I guess you're four for four then, aren't you? 
<laughs> I guess I can claim this one, yeah. But then after this, it uh, there's some other uh, other drugs that uh, I haven't taken, like rapamycin. He says is one of the most consistently successful compounds for extending life, as it's an mTOR inhibitor. I'm kind of losing my own scientific knowledge here, but yeah, if you pop a few rapamycin pills, you can uh, inhibit your mTOR. A few of the kids call it rappers these days. <laughs> pop a few rappers when you go to the clubs. Uh, metformin. We'll list a few here. Metformin, STAC, so Stax, Fisetin, Butane. Uh, resveratrol, I've heard of that one and I've taken it. Oh, really? Yeah, it was a byproduct of a coffee once. So oh, nice. I was going for the coffee and save for the res. <laughs> uh, NAD, NAD, so, NR. And it, so now we're really just, yeah. <laughs> we're just... There's a whole bunch of shit you can probably find on a blog somewhere right. and um, I feel put like, in a um, cocktail and, and yeah. yeah, live forever. I feel like you always hear this on every every sixth episode of Tim Ferriss. He starts pumping out talking about rapamycin, metformin, NAD, NR, resveratrol, NMN. If you if you go to the pharmacy and ask for a few of these pills, maybe they can hand you over and you'll live an extra ten or twenty years. Maybe there probably is upside in taking all of these, but there probably is some experimental downside of. I'm sure there is <laughs> being on the cutting edge of these longevity <laughs> stuff, and you're probably going to be ironically kicking the can, maybe. Mm. Other than the people just sitting on the couch watching Netflix. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Another uh, important sort of more modern breakthrough is biotracking. So, this is to do with the idea that you're constantly tracking different elements of your body and how it's operating. And by detecting any slight differences from the norm, then you can treat things as they pop up. Um, and this is what he calls precision medicine. So it's not just going to the pharmacy and, and getting a regular prescription and getting the same jar that everybody else gets. This is getting medicine specifically tailored to you and your specific needs. That's it. Uh, we've covered a few times about the mapping of the human genome. It was like a billion dollar project. It took over 20 years. Luckily today, because of technological advances, um, I think you can do it for a couple hundred bucks in a couple of days. You can map your whole entire genome and and see what makes you you and you know you can detect all sorts of diseases that are more likely to smack you over the head as you get older um, and with that you can do all sorts of proactive medicine to to get over that and uh, the drug developers out there who figured this out they can use your genomic information to get really tailored and specific drugs um, just for you and now Davo says, let's do a little math and let's we'll keep it on the conservative end of the spectrum. Uh, let's assume that there's all these different Mate, technologies. I think, uh, I think whoever, whenever there's something, let's do some math and making conservative. <laughs> Almost every time it's never conservative. It's like saying something and then but. It's like when they say that, what the preceding that, it's yeah. going to be opposite. Anyway, we'll go, we'll go some conservative math. He says that um, so DNA monitoring, the, the biotracking stuff, we're going to that's soon going to alert doctors to your specific disease long before they kind of before they actually hit and make a big difference. We're going to be able to identify and begin to fight cancer years earlier. We're going to if you have an infection, it's going to be diagnosed within minutes. If your heartbeat is irregular, there's going to be a tracking system in your car seat that's going to let you know. There's going to be a breath analyzer that can detect these immune diseases. Uh, so I don't know how conservative some of these things are. Um, <laughs> but basically say... Oh, his, math, his math is conservative. So assuming all those things happen, which are coming... Um, uh, then there's conservative math. Currently, there's the median age is 80 years. We can expect to kick the can. Yeah. He says we can easily add 33 on top of that. Okay. I was, yeah, I suppose it's reasonably conservative. That's a median, man. So there'll be a fair few people um, breaking that 120 barrier. I suppose that's pretty conservative. Compared to where the book started and he said there's no reason we need to age, there's no limit, I suppose 113 is is uh, conservative compared to infinity. Hmm. So he says this is the most exciting time in history for the advancement of longevity and our lives. It's a bit like, think about the Wright brothers when they were back in their workshop. They'd flown down the, the gliders, the stand dunes of the kitty hawk that they made and from that point, no one knew what was going on in this back shop. But the world absolutely changed because of flight and in space of what, you know, what was that, 1903 to us now, 120 years later, it's 
remarkable the changes in in air flight we've had since then yeah that's right from from humans being able to never fly to now people heading into space then that's a massive jump in just a few short decades he's saying now we're kind of at that the wright brothers level of these these different experiments to you know extending the telomeres and keeping the epigenome healthy but within a few short decades we could be hitting the mars level of uh of life extension and extension of vitality So we're at a point of a serious historical inflection. It's a time in which us humans, we're going to redefine what is possible and it's going to be a time of ending the inevitable, which is aging. ACAST recommends black creators who are making an impact this month and beyond. Welcome to Two Black Girls, One Rose. Where two black ass girls evade the whitest show on earth. The The Bachelor. Bachelor. I'm Natasha. And I'm Justine. And every week we recap this dumpster fire of an American pastime. We call out the problematic mess of the Bachelor franchise, interview special guests like Rachel Lindsay and Mike Johnson, crown a Becky of the week and invite someone to our cookout. In addition to the Bachelor franchise, we also recap Married at First Sight, Love is Blind, and other reality TV mess. Listen to the first 20 minutes of every episode on Acast, and for exclusive access to our full episodes, join us on Patreon at patreon.com backslash the number two black girls, the number one rose. A cash recommends. <laughs>